Hi, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we're talking about the concept of before the foundation of the world. This phrase, before the foundation of the world, and as it is famously found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. <clears throat> so I want to I want to look at a couple things this morning. And by the way, since we are dealing with um, since we're using a phrase that is a common catchphrase for Calvinists, I do need to uh, start off with a couple of things that Calvinists need to understand before they start commenting. Because uh, lately, when we cover stuff about Calvinism, we get a lot of diarrhea of the mouth from some of these guys. So let's look at something before we get started. We have a disclaimer. All you Calvinists out there, Beyond the Fundamentals does not promote or agree with Arminianism, Pelagianism, Universalism, Synergism, Monergism, or any other ideological label to which Calvinists attempt to map their theological opponents. We also do not hold free will as an axiomatic premise, nor do we worship ourselves or think that we save ourselves. So before you comment on the channel, notice, uh, understand that. As we go forward, also understand that we have many, many, many videos on Calvinism. So whenever we start talking about anything that pertains to Calvinism here, uh, inevitably there's always somebody who starts to think that there is something that we're overlooking that they need to mention in the comment section that we don't know about. Well, we know about it and we've got other videos on it. Okay. So I ask people to keep their comments focused on uh, what's going on here on this channel. Now, I want to thanks everybody, thank everybody for watching the channel, who, uh, for supporting the channel, because we could not do this without you. We, we rely on support to keep this going. If the support dries up, we will either quit or monetize or something like that. So thanks for everybody who keeps this going and keeps it ad-free for now. We really appreciate that. And good morning to everybody in the chat. It is good to see you. So as we move forward, we are talking about things that pertain to Calvinism today, but, but we're not, so this is not a Calvinism refutation video, but what, it, what this is, is this is exploratory thought that happens to be using a verse that has been hijacked by Calvinists uh, who don't understand the verse. Okay. So we have a lot of videos on this phrase, um, on this passage, and let, let's look at what kind of what got us into this. We're going through the book of Acts, and we came across this verse in Acts chapter 14, verse 13. Barnabas and Saul, they go to Lystra, all right? And Lystra is one of the cities of Laconia, and they just healed a guy. So let's, let's, let's back you up so we can see where we are. They see a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, crippled in his mother's womb, never walked, they heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, uh, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leapt and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Laconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. So this is an example, an example where you have good evidence, bad conclusion. And some people might say something crazy like, Look, we have evidence of our own gods, Jupiter and Mercury, because look, look at Paul and Barnabas there. So that kind of thing happens a lot where people, it, the interpretation of the evidence is automatically interpreted with where people are in their own world view. Now that happens a lot in scripture. So whenever somebody is in the world view, they are possessed by an ideology of like Calvinism. They will automatically interpret what they see as Calvinism would demand it because they obey Calvinism and they have to, they have no choice. They have no agency in the matter. Um, when it comes to free will, I think Calvinists are the only people who don't have any, perhaps. <laughs> really, anybody who's ideologically possessed. Uh, they are being bossed around. I say that kind of as a joke about Calvinism. But they are being bossed around by an ideology. The ideology is using them as an avatar to advance itself in the soil of humanity. Okay, And the people involved have no say in the matter. And they called Barnabas and Jupiter. Uh, they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercury, because he was a, he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. Now this word before stood out to me, and that's what we're talking about today. Over here in the other side, on the right hand side, I'm going to go over to Ephesians chapter one verse four, and I just happened to notice that this word before 
as in before the foundation of the world, is the exact same English and Greek word as before in Acts 14, 13, before their city. Now, when a Calvinist reads Ephesians 1, 4, they're going to automatically think of before the foundation of the world in like they think that is a reference to order of chronology, okay? And I'm not necessarily here to refute that today. What I'm here to do is do exploratory hermeneutical thought, if you will, that kind of thing, on Ephesians 1, 4, irrespective of Calvinism. But since it rubs Calvinis Calvinists the wrong way, we're going to field all kinds of accusations of heresy and everything else. Look <laughs> at the comments section has been so revealing <laughs> of, of some of these ideologically possessed uh, non-player characters spouting off their Calvinism. They've even gone so far as one of them suggested that I was gay. And my wife had to tell them to back off. He's taken. Because I think the dude was probably trying to hide his own gayness. Um, and he had, you know, he gave all the same answers a gay person would give. Look, I have eight kids and a beautiful wife. That's, that's exactly what a gay person would have as a cover who believes, who is trying to cover the fact that they are gay. So we've, we've got gay Calvinists out there trying to hook up with yours truly, uh, inadvertently. I mean, it's just, it's just resorted into a cesspool in the comment section because we have these ideologically possessed people who cannot listen for what's trying to be said. Now, when we're presenting something, on this channel, what I'm going to do here today is exploratory thought. It is not me trying to teach you a way to think. When we're finished with what we're going to reveal here today, we may all decide to wad it up and throw it in the trash can. The, the process of engaging with this together in exploratory thought is, is the point. The conclusion that somebody may draw or any perspective that may be presented is not the point. We are not teaching any perspective that you might hear today. We are using it as a thought exercise. And the process of going through the thought exercise is the point. Now, there's something trying to be said here that I am trying to facilitate, however imperfectly, that I may do so. Okay? So, what I want you to listen for is the thing that's trying to be said. If you are out there in the audience and you're just looking to problematize what I'm saying and try to make me look like I'm contradicting myself and ask me, what church are you the pastor of and all this kind of nonsense, if you're trying to uh, commit a genetic logical fallacy by attacking me and you're not trying to listen to what's trying to be said, then by all means, I need you to stop. I'm not talking to you and neither is God, by the way, okay? So we're going to go forward, and the audience here today, what I want you to do, if you are trying to listen to what's trying to be said, I'm talking to you. If you're looking to just try to find something you can use against me to discredit me, I'm not talking to you. Go ahead and change the channel, all right? Because you're not going to like what we're going to present today, for sure. Yeah, the guy had a big family, which according to Calvinism, apparently is the marker of how holy you are now. You're morally superior. <laughs> he said, well, a big family means that you are uh, morally superior. Yeah, exactly. And so <laughs> as soon as you identify something that's supposed to be a marker, like a nine marks of salvation, as soon as you start identifying things that are supposed to be a marker of what constitutes virtue and goodness, people are going to start emulating that without actually embodying the wisdom that produced it. Okay? So... Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> okay, so let's charge forward here. Let's charge forward. Are we ready for this? Are y'all ready to hear this? Now, before we go forward, I want you to know that we have done videos on predestination. We have done videos on the origin of Calvinism. We have, I think, at least 250 videos addressing Calvinism on the passages that Calvinists use. 250 on the channel. There's more videos than that on the channel, but I think there's at least 250 on the channel that deal with that. If you'll excuse me just for a second.
Sometimes we have allergies acting up and we have to do things about those. Uh, one of the difficulties of going live. All right, so if you're in the chat section, you're just posting a whole bunch of stuff, I want you to stop and listen, okay? Um, stop and listen and think, okay? I know everyone already has opinions about what we're going about the verses that we're talking about. I want you to put those put those opinions aside and listen to what I'm trying to say today. Okay. <clears throat> so we already have videos on predestination. We have several of those. We have videos on the origin of Calvinism. We have videos on election. We've dealt right way into these things. If you're a Calvinist, you need to know that we do believe in predestination. We do believe in election. We just do not believe in the Augustinian or Gnostic versions of predestination and election. We believe in the biblical version of predestination. Theology. The predestination of theology does not match the predestination of Scripture. The predestination of Calvo-Arminianism, Calvinism and Arminianism is over here. And the predestination in Scripture is over here. Saved people are predestinated to the adoption, which is glorification, and to their inheritance, and to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. There are no lost people who are ever uh, predestinated to be converted. That is not Scripture. That's Gnosticism. That's Augustine. That is not Scripture. Okay? We actually, unlike Calvinists, try to practice sola scriptura around here, and I invite you to do the same. So we look at this verse here before and this is the word that we're talking about here and if we take it over to ephesians 1 4 now before this is the same word in greek and english that appears in ephesians 1 4 it is definitely not a reference to the order of time in which things refer to occur as it is used here now it's very interesting if you look down in so the word where's the word before before here same greek word and english word i'll even make it blue let's make it blue so that'll stand out and before here, same Greek word, same English word. So if you look it up in these dictionaries, uh, preposition with genitive before time or place and four, 14 years ago and then six days before the Passover. So it could be, it could be, right? So we grant that it could be a, time, a chronology thing, but it could be a priority thing. Like in if in or it could be a, a physical placement thing. So in if he, in Acts fourteen thirteen, before their city, this is a guy who was physically placed in front of the city. So the word before could mean that. And then we have the concept of it meaning above all else. We're going to look at that in a second too. The word pro pro prem. That's the Greek word is pro that gets translated into before. Sounds just like our word pro noun something like that. Okay, we use the word pro all the time. In front of, prior, above, ago, before, or ever. In uh, comparison, it retains the same significations, kind of like we do uh, in very similar to English. So if we look at some of these other passages, notice down here that some of these other passages, James 5, 12, 1 Peter 4, 8, are suggested as this. So if we look at those in James 5, 12, but above all things, my brethren, above all things, what if he said before all things? If he said before all things, you might think that he was talking about like chronology, uh, a sequence of events prior to. Prior to all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by... Well, how would you, how would you understand that? It wouldn't make any sense. And above all things, fervent charity among yourselves, charity shall cover a multitude of sins. So this word, the same Greek word pro, could be translated as above. And especially for those of you who just, and anybody, even those of you who are like rabid King James only, okay, you need to understand that uh, even a commentary or a paraphrase, when pre preachers preach, they're paraphrasing all the time. And so when I suggest this, are we disrupting the word of God? No, we're suggesting, I, I, I believe there's multiple ways that a passage could be worded as you're preaching or commenting on it to help get the sense of it. That's exactly what happened in Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 9, I believe, where they read out of the book of law of God distinctly and they gave a sense of it and they caused the people to understand. How do you do that? You use a bunch of words that aren't actually in the text to explain the text. Remember, words are only pointers, okay? And if you have one set of signifiers, in order to get the proper uh, sense of those signifiers, you might use a whole bunch of other signifiers that are pointing at the same thing. You have to think about what the signifiers are pointing to and not make a doctrine out of the signifiers themselves 
which is the problem with our friends over here in systematic theology land where the words themselves are the doctrine. We had somebody commenting in the YouTube channel just recently, uh, you have no business teaching doctrine, that kind of thing. Well, guess what? They think that doctrine is a set of words, like a series of semantically disambiguated phenomes that can come out of your mouth is what a doctrine is. No, 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 no. Those things can point to a doctrine. A doctrine is a policy, principle, or procedure by which we should behave procedurally, perspectively, participatorily. And it has to point at one of those other three kinds of knowing in order for it to be valid. A, um, a doctrine that is itself a self-contained doctrine as a statement loops back to just words. It's nothing. It'd be like money that can't buy anything is what that would be like, okay? In order for it to in order for currency to be valuable, it has to be pointing at something that is not itself. Does it make sense? So people think they have wealth when they have a bunch of money in the bank. Actually, money is really assuming that that wealth is actually assuming that that money can buy something. Okay? So wealth is actually the groceries that you take home with you. It's actually the vehicle in your garage. It's the house, you know, the, the clothes, you're the, that's the wealth. The other stuff is an abstraction of wealth and at the flip of a hat could turn into non-wealth. <clears throat> so, mm, if we could, uh, yeah, let's not get into a Bible version debate in the chat section. So what if we took this idea over here, above all things, that Greek rendition of the word pro, and above all things, as in higher priority than all things, what if we took that over here to Ephesians 1.4? According as he hath chosen us in him, it actually isn't KJV anymore, so we're going to say uh, commentary, right? According as he hath chosen us in him above the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So what if we do a thought exercise where we understand the verse that way? Now, I'm not saying that's how to understand it. I'm saying what if we do a thought exercise where that's how we understand it? What would that, what would that imply? Okay, where, What are we talking about there? To me, it makes a whole lot more sense to say it that way. You take, um, G Jesus says in John 17, 24, thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. It also makes sense there, above the foundation, as a higher priority than the foundation of the world. So what would this mean? What if we do a thought exercise and we back up all the way back up into the mind, let's place ourselves for the sake of perspectival knowing we're going to place, yeah, primacy. That's a good one. Priority, importance, primacy. These are good ones. Okay. Yes. So let's let's write that down here. Um, I'm going to make this. Well, we might have a little room to work with. So we're going to say primacy, importance, and uh, priority. Thanks to some of our commenters for these. So these are these are good examples. As a priority above the foundation of the world, primacy, importance. Okay. So the concept of the people. Now, what did I do in my title before the foundation of the world that Calvinists often always do is this phrase, in him. And that's a very important thing to point out because when we go to the scripture, the in him thing is very important. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, you have has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. In my video, chosen, censored, what they're hiding from Ephesians 1 4, I show many, many, many quotations from Calvinists where they are referring to Ephesians 1.4 and they just conveniently leave out the phrase in him. Why do they do that? Okay, Several reasons, but it creates a problem because if you keep going in Ephesians, that's one way to cure you of Calvinism is just to keep reading. That'll clear it up every time. If you keep going in Ephesians, what you will find in chapter 2, if you get past the part which you think is about Lazarus and is not, and get to all the way to verse 11 and 12. Wherefore, remember that ye being saved people, because in Ephesians 1, 3, I have to show you this over here, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Uh, Paul, an apostle, to who? Who's he writing to? Saints, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. He's talking to believers, not talking to lost people. 
Wherefore, remember, saints, believers, that in times past, being Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh, uh, made by hands. In other words, the Jews are calling you uncircumcised. That at that time, before you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ. Very important phrase. They went from not being in Christ to being in Christ. When? In their lifetime. In their lifetime. That's when that happened. Uh, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ. That's the change. Ye who were sometimes far off from made nigh by the blood of Christ. So there is something that took place in time that put them in Christ, which is why over in Romans chapter 16, verse 7, Paul says this phrase like, who were these people... Andronicus and Junia, who also were in Christ before me. Getting placed in Christ takes place in time, okay? Somebody said, I think they make the mistake from Revelation 13, 8 and try to correlate Ephesians 1, 4. And by the way, Re Revelation 13, 8 doesn't have the word before in it like they think it does. They quote it. They quote the word. That's enough. They add before to, the, to Revelation 13, 8. Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It doesn't say before there. And, uh, but when you hear them quote it, they will quote it with the word before there, which is interesting. Looking at the comments over here. <clears throat> so the word in him, the phrase in him creates a big problem for Calvinists. We're, we're really going to explore this. We want to take all of the text and believe all the text and create. We're going to do a thought exercise as if this word above here would be a correct rendering of the intent behind what is being said in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. So what if we follow this through? Now, I want, I want you to understand that this word ekleo here, um, chosen, first of all, election and predestination are not the same thing. They are two different words. They sound different, they're spelled different, and they have different definitions. So never use the words predestination and election as if they are interchangeable. They are not. They are two different words. Also, never ever create a doctrine from something like this and then backwards read it back into the appearance of these words. If you open up a book written by a remedial person like Wayne Grudem, you're going to get a doctrine of election. And then you, what you will do is you will eisegete that doctrine back into the appearance of the word in the text. That is eisegesis. That is not what we want to do. We want to do exegesis. What that means is is that we, term, we determine the meaning of every passage we encounter. I think I just typed something by accident. I hit the keyboard. We interpret every passage we encounter in the context in which it appears afresh, anew. We don't bring any other thoughts into it. So when we see the word election, we don't bring a word, we don't bring a doctrine of election into it. We don't say, we don't equate election with salvation like the Calvinists do. And we don't presume also that election is always about service, even though when you do an analysis on every appearance of the word, it happens to turn out that way. But we don't presume that. We get that, uh, we get that after the investigation, not prior to the investigation. Okay. <clears throat> so election and predestination are not the same thing. Chosen us in him. Above the foundation of the world is our thought experiment that we're doing here, that we should be something, be something. So, so cho election is not about salvation in the sense of conversion. It's about, really, it's about service, sanctification, transformation, Sorry, and future blessing. No, Siri, I don't want to say that again. It's about... <laughs> sanctification, transformation, glorification, future blessing, those kinds of things with an emphasis on service. Now this be here is a verb that we should be something holy and without blame before him in love. This is not forensic. A Calvinist is going to read this as forensic. Well, we are this positionally because we are in Christ, even though they left the in Christ out of the way the verse was quoted before. This is actually a precursor for the entire chapter, for the entire book we are going to be told how to be, as in behave, okay? Being, doing, being, and becoming. That kind, that sense of the word be, okay? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love in this sense of behavior. Because if you keep going in the book, what you're going to find in places like Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, 
unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So over here, I'm going to get you Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. And a Calvinist is going to think this chosen in us in him before the foundation. They think that's about salvation. It is not. It is about being, being holy and without blame before him in love. And the same idea gets reiterated over here in chapter 2, verse 10, created in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So the sense of Ephesians 1, 4 shows up in Ephesians 2, 10. Again, if you just keep reading. So before the foundation of the world, God ordained, ordained that those in Christ would walk a certain way. So this book is about the walk. It's about the behavior and the service of those who are in Christ and those who are in Christ are chosen to be holy and without blame, to behave, do, be, and become in a holy way, walking in these good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them, created in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're a new creature, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 18, right around there. So created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That, in other words, after you are converted, this becomes a reality. And the purpose for which you are converted, the purpose that you should serve, was ordained before. Before, which God had before. Now, it doesn't tell you when before. It just says before. Had before ordained. So before you get saved, you could say above there, but before... Before you get saved, the way you should behave is kind of already determined. There's a certain, uh, God wants you to be in the flow of the Logos, doing what the Logos would have you do. The agency that the Logos would have you do in and through you. Because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 13, it is God which worketh in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, what we were getting at in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, here, okay, this sense of before the foundation of the world, if you keep going in this holy and without blame before him in love, you get it reiterated again in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. What are you talking about? What's the vocation? Right here, to be holy and without blame before him in love. And you are called to walk worthy of that in accordance with chapter 2, verse 10. This is, this is all about the behavior of the believer. There's a certain thing that the intention of creating humans in the first place was for them to behave a certain way. And the, the secret ingredient that will help catalyze that behavior and that service is in Christ. It's found in Christ. So we need to get people in Christ so that this can happen. Now, what would that look like? If you have humans who are acting like what uh, God would have somebody to look like, it might look something like this. In Ephesians chapter 1, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 through 16, it would probably look something like this. Same chapter we were just in, chapter 4, verse 1. This is chapter 4, verse 13 through 16. We're going to be edified by the fivefold ministry until something happens. There's, there's like a growth. There's a coalescence that something, uh, mankind should turn into something. Kind of like integral theory. Now, when I refer to integral theory, I'm not accepting all the propositions of integral theory. What I like about integral theory, Ken Wilber, is the idea, the framework of an idea of the maturation process of mankind as a whole from one level to a next. You might think in the most basic sense that mankind needed Israel to be following the law for a certain number of years, like 1,500 years from Moses to Christ, and then Christ was sent at the right time for mankind. So these are witnesses to all of the world, all of mankind, and at the right time, God intervenes in a certain way to put certain things in the path because mankind, or what you might say is, the propensity, the, the capability of mankind once in Christ can achieve something that otherwise could not be done. And there is a maturation process of mankind in general, and it was ready for Christ when Christ was sent. Christ was sent at the right time. And then Christ 
the the story of Christ's life and passion, that sort of thing, is necessary for the next phases of the development that come afterward. Okay. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, you get the fivefold ministry preparing those who are in Christ to be something. What, what are they supposed to be? They're being holy and without blame before him in love. And what does that look like? One part of what that looks like, to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith they are called, is be edified by the fivefold ministry till this happens. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that's why we call our Wednesday night session, we call it the Full Stature Initiative. <laughs> Let me text somebody real quick. Actually, it can wait. I got somebody's, uh, somebody's kid over at my house. But <clears throat> uh, spend the night with the kids. And so they're trying to do a little uh, <laughs> coordination here. But we won't be doing this for very much longer. So that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. That's an example. That's, that's a description of what these people would look like who move and they not carried about with every wind of doctrine. No, okay, so they are post, they are beyond stuff like this. They're no longer beholden to propositional words that can actually see clearly and don't need a description of the thing because they can see it. When you need a description of the thing and propositions, it means you can't see clearly. So if you... Are you th if you think a statement of faith per or a confession of faith prevents people from going into heresy, what that means is you can't see clearly and you can't imagine anybody who can. It's like a blind person not being able to imagine vision. That's what's going on there. But the idea is to move past nonsense like this, pacifiers and bottles and oatmeal and baby food, and to get on into past the milk and get into some of the meat where you are no longer holding on to, you can actually progress into wisdom and you're no longer holding on to this stuff, this milky stuff by the slide of men and cunning craftiness were by the lion wake to deceive. But now you are able, you speak the truth in love and you're growing up into Christ in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom? Now you're no longer connected to an institution. You're no longer connected to a statement of faith. You're no longer connected to a pastor or a priest to get your edification. You have the anointing, the unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. All things are available to you, and you can tap into it, and you need not that any man teach you. Okay, The whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Now you can provide edification as well as receive it, and you can exercise discernment. According to the effectual working of the measure in every part, maketh the increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love. A mature Christian, a wise Christian who is tapped into the logos, tapped into wisdom, can participate in this. Those people who think stuff like this is doctrine, cannot, they cannot participate in this. They are not ready for this. They need to go back to the fivefold ministry and try again. Or imagine over here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 19, that he, God, Christ, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, he which worketh in you, both the will and to do of his good pleasure, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, agape, the way of charity, Ephesians, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, may be able, able to comprehend with all saints. And that, what do you mean all saints? Everybody working together in a distributed cognition, in a collective intelligence, comprehend with all saints. He needs them all working together. What is the breadth and length and depth and height? And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You might think that huh, when I was a kid, there was a bunch of sermons against all the toys that were cool. There was a bunch of, I was an independent Baptist church and everything was the devil. Disney was the devil. Star Wars was the devil. G.I. Joe was the devil. Uh, Voltron was the devil. <laughs> and in Voltron, you have... There's a couple different versions of Voltron. There's one that is made of cats, and it's five cats, and that's the one that, that's the one that got all the bad sermons about it, because five is the number of death, and the one in the middle was Satan, you see? But there's this one made of cars, and I seem to have a memory. I'm just giving you an example. Is I seem to have a memory of a kind of Voltron that had a lot more cars than this. Instead of, I don't know, this looks like 20 or something cars, but they, or tanks or something, too. I don't know. But there was one when I was a kid that was a, it was a whole bunch of cars. I mean, like like 200 cars, a whole bunch of them. And the idea is something Christians being able to come together. And, and I'm and I'm not trying to promote Voltron. I'm not asking for a bunch of sermons on how demonic this is. It's not the point. The point is that 
I have a difficult time conveying to you the thought in my head of some kind of thing where all the Christians are connected together, connected together in a distributed cognition, in a collective intelligence, right? And that's just an idea that popped into my head and maybe you can work out something a little bit better. I want you to try to hear what I'm trying to say, okay? Now, I want to use an analogy of artificial intelligence, okay? Imagine you're going to create an artificially intelligent thing. You would need to have certain things in your end state. And, And what am I trying to do here? We are not God. I'm not trying to make us God. But in order to enhance our perspectival knowing, sometimes you have to put yourself in the shoes of other people to try to understand where they're coming from, okay? We, uh, and I'm not saying that humans are artificial intelligence. (laughs) One guy said, uh, they keep looking for intelligent life on other planets. I'm not sure there's much intelligent life here, (laughs) okay? Uh, So I'm not saying uh, that humans are artificial intelligence. But what I'm saying is if we were to try to create something, if you put yourself in the shoes of God, not for the sake of magnifying yourself, but for the sake of, because I know that's what the Calvinists are going to say. Isn't it? Doesn't it ever make you sad, Calvinists, that you guys are so predictable? that you have like certain buttons that you're always going to play those plays. <laughs> we, we already know your playbook, okay? So we're not doing this. We're not putting ourselves in the place of God, in the shoes of God, in order to magnify ourselves that we are God. Nothing like that. But for the sake of perspectival knowing, like when you ask a kid, put yourself in your, in your dad's shoes. Imagine having to pay all the bills and getting everybody to turn off all the lights. Or put yourself in your mom's shoes. Imagine having to, you know, whatever. That kind of thing. Put yourself in your boss's shoes at work and imagine all the responsibilities they have to deal with before you start being too critical of them. And so that is a good thing to do in perspectival knowing for whatever being you're considering, imagine yourself in that role. And if you had to start from scratch doing, doing from scratch what they are doing, what would you do? And what would you do differently? So what you would have to do is if you want men who can come together, if you want humankind who can come together in this collective intelligence, you would have to have that end state in mind before the experiment was created. And because people are operating, because there's places doing things like with deep mind and things like that, that are actually working with AI today, we can kind of get a sense of what they have learned. And you would have to imagine that God, of course, would already know the things that they have learned and they would understand some of the prerequisites that are required in order to get an intelligence that would do certain things. Now, the difficult thing for me to describe what that certain thing is, is because when you approach a conversation in good faith, when you're trying to have genuine dialogos and dialogue, you have to be open-ended and you can't, it's not like a debate. It's not where you can come with a predefined conclusion in mind. You have to come to a dialogue with the understanding that something new and insightful will emerge that will change you, okay? So for me to sit here and try to describe precisely what it is that the body of Christ can achieve, for me to be too precise with that or try to attempt to be, attempt to be too precise with that would be profane. Because as we continue going along in the edification model of Ephesians four thirteen through 16, the thing that is supposed to be will emerge through us and not just through me, but through a collection of us together edifying each other. So something is going to emerge that's going to create an enormous amount, uh, almost seemingly infinite amount of agency to do something. And it's going to be through wisdom and the logos being in Christ, if you will, that these things will emerge. But I cannot describe them to you. So I need you to, so the the reason I had the Voltron thing here is just as a an idea of something all working together in a collective that has greater agency than the sum of its parts. Just an example of that. And of course, that's not comparable to what the body of Christ could achieve if properly edified to the full stature of the image of Christ. So this end state is something like a collective intelligence with infinite agency for insight, cultivation, and co-creative ability. Because mankind, we have the ability to modify our environment. We can change things. We can chop trees down. We can plant new ones. We can plant food. We can build houses. We can modify the environment to a degree. And the more more technology we get, 
the more co-creative capability we have. Maybe, you know, one day we could be like a type one or a type two civilization. Maybe we'll be building Dyson spheres one day, okay? And uh, have warp speed and be going around the galaxy. And I mean, who knows what could possibly be happening? And I'm just throwing ideas out there that are way beyond what we could possibly do right now. So what would this need to be? You would think when they started making AI, they started thinking they could program AI to do certain things. But then they found out the hard way that, nope, and the best AI has to be self-learning, just like a child is, has to be self-learning. And then they found, found out that a, intelligence, uh, <laughs> cognition, in other words, this comes from 4E cognition, by the way, cognition needs to be embodied. In other words, I can't just create an intelligence and stick it on a hard drive somewhere I need to put it in a body. I need to put this intelligence in a body that has arms and legs and feet and has things that it can move and has an environment to interact with. We have found that out. So it needs to be corporeal in a body. It needs to be embedded. It needs to be placed in an active, in an interactive environment. Um, enacted. It needs to. <laughs> it needs to be in a place where action compresses prehension. In other, in other words, you have to have active agency and the the capacity to participatorily act within the environment and make modifications to it and it needs to be extended and the the extension would include tools and distributed cognition etc and so forth now the mechanisms of growth you would need to think about see I'm I'm trying to describe the end state here and how we get there how do we get an infinitely agentic intelligence how do we get that um, the mechanisms to get this artificial self-learning intelligence there would need to be something like wisdom and the logos. And you need to find some way for these people to be able to discover this and, and act within it and choose it, that sort of thing. Uh, a collection of consciousnesses. Now, I don't want to take too much time to develop this because of how much time we're on fa so far. But like internal family systems, we discover in psychology that inside each human is a collection of consciousnesses, not just one person. If you ever get traumatized, some people get those dislodged and are no longer unified under a single personality, and you have multiple personalities, all right? That's, that's a real thing that happens. Well, just like computers, if I have one computer, I have a certain amount of computing power, but I can do a lot more with computers if I put them in a network. And then if I have a World Wide Web, look how much more I can do. Just connecting different processors gives you so much more capability and humans are the same way. The more we can connect, you have several connected in your own head already that are unified under a certain personality, ideally, if, you, if you're well, right? And then if you have multiple humans together, ideally, if they are well, they could operate in a distributed cognition, okay? And something that I would say about this, this collective consciousness, is that our in-groups right now, the tribalism, these are... <laughs> These need to develop beyond because right now our in-groups are like a primordial prototype of collective intelligence that should follow later. Right now, our in-groups are epistemically pathological. We cannot do good sense-making within in-groups because uh, being in the in-group and being ranked well within the in-group is a higher priority to us than finding truth. But when finding truth becomes the normative, when finding Sophia, wisdom, philia Sophia becomes the, the normative feature of an in-group, that is when it can grow into a collective intelligence, okay? But right now, the in-groups that we have based on tribalism and team sports and all that nonsense, those are like a primordial prototype that have to basically change and evolve over time into something that is less egoic, right? So that's going to have to happen soon. And then there's a capability. If I want to make an artificial intelligence, of putting myself in the shoes of God for perspectival knowing, they have to be able to modify their arena. And they change their arena. Like now I did not used to have roads. Now I have paved roads. I did not used to have a house. Now we have built a house. We've changed the arena. Things are different. We did not used to have a plow. Now we have a plow. As you modify the environment, you also need to have... Uh, recursive software adaptability. What does that mean? Every Humans, uh, we are neotenous for a long time compared to other animals. Horses are walking around in 20 minutes or less, whereas humans, it takes them about a year. The reason we are neotenous for so long 
and it takes us so long to reach maturity, 18, 20 years, and some of us a lot longer than that, right? Um, the reason it takes us so long to reach maturity is because we have to kind of be what you might consider a blank slate and be trainable and adaptable to any kind of environment. You have humans living around the North Pole as Eskimos, and then you have humans living in the Sahara Desert, and then you have humans living in you know, agricultural environments, hunter-gatherer environments, and you have humans living in very urban and technological environments. But any human, same DNA, you can be basically trained. Your culture is programming you to operate in that operating system, if you will. The culture is like an operating system. You're being trained along in it, right? And so you could imagine that that 18 to 20 years is the amount of time that it takes for the operating system to be installed on you for to be adaptable to that society. And the reason we are neotenous for so long is so that we have a greater quantity, a uh, greater potential of different environments to which we can be programmed, to, for which we can have the operating system downloaded. Okay, And you can increase your sovereignty and have m perhaps multiple um, of those downloaded on you. But we, you have to be able to do that. So you could train a kid to be a hunter-gatherer multiple years ago. I hate the way these uh, quotation marks are backwards like this. Or you could train them to be... Um, you know, a, a coder for a technological company right now, which is, you know, completely different things, but humans can be, we're adaptable. We can be programmed to these many things. And then survivability, which is sometimes based on rewards, things like that. <clears throat> Getting a lot of comments here from uh, Kiss the Sun. Um like blocks of software script put together to make a functioning program. Yes. So if you're thinking about uh, putting yourself, if you had to create an artificial intelligence, all these things, so embedded is what I kind of want to think about. If you're going to have this, if you're going to have this artificial, so let me, let me read this first. The realized potential capacity of the AI, in this case man, is the prime reason for any of this activity. So the, what you, the desired end state is to have this collective intelligence, but... It has to be somewhere. It has to be embedded somewhere. It has to be placed in an interactive environment. Right? The creation of Earth simply meets the embedded requirement. What am I trying to say right here? Have been created in him, chosen in him before the foundation of the world, above the foundation of the world. In other words, the goal of creation was the end state of what mankind could become in Christ. That's the goal of creation, if you will. And I don't know what that potential is. It's probably indescribable to people at our level of understanding. Maybe in a few hundred years, they'll start to get it if FSI keeps going that long, <laughs> right? Because that's what we need. We need people actually doing the Ephesians 4, 13 through 16 edification model. Non-egoically, non-paradigmatically, not propositionally tyrannized like all the Christians are today. So it's a complete radical revolution of how people think of church needs to very much change in order for this to come along. So, <laughs> yes, thanks, Forging Beyond Belief. Try to restrain yourself from interpreting Kevin's words or point to that of unrelated scripture points. Yes, please just stop and listen. If you're posting a whole bunch of things in the chat section, just stop and listen, please. All right. Um, so I have all these artificial intelligence. So that what they found is there's a lot of things that are not very clear. Like if you create a little man, an artificial intelligence land, you create the physics landscape and all this sort of stuff, and you tell it to get from point A to point B, it will not walk like we walk. They found that these things, they tumble over each other and did like a bunch of cartwheels to get where they're going. Because they don't have pain receptors, there's nothing sensitive on them, so you have to modify them to be more like humans as you go, more embodied, and then you have different things. And so then they put obstacles and these things learn. Now this one over here on the bottom left is walking on seesaw terrain that it has never seen before. It has been taught to keep its balance, it has learned to keep its balance uh, because it's self-learning and interacting with the environment. And... and but it has never seen this seesaw terrain before, like movable floors, and it is running through them and keeping its balance. 
as it's going. So that that's gives you an example of these. And sometimes these things stumble. You try to give it a task to do, and it's trying to learn. So you can kind of imagine what we have learned with AI. And some of the things they have to have with AI is you have to have an agent, uh, an environment, or an arena. There's an action that needs to do, and there needs to be a reward associated with an action in order to get get them to desire to do it more. So if if uh, if eating didn't feel good, people might not do it and they might die. If mating wasn't pleasurable, then people might not do it and the whole race would die off. So you need these things to be able to modify their environment, then produce kids that are programmed or got the operating system for the new environment and you need a whole bunch of iterations of that to happen and then many generations later we're going to get a more refined product of what we want out of out of an artificial intelligence and so these guys who do this kind of thing deep mind introduces xland an open-ended 3d simulated environmental space to train and evaluate artificial intelligences well, what's it really for it's for the artificial intelligences but all this other stuff, this 3D environment space, the 3D open-ended 3D simulated environmental space, that is created for the artificial agents. The artificial agents are above that in priority and the 3D environmental space is just a prerequisite in order to get the artificial agents. Are you understanding me? Are you putting things together yet? So. He hath chosen us in him, above the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Like our artificial, our artificial intelligence should behave a certain way, but we need it to we need it to be in an environment. It has to have a before we need to have a world. We need to create a world so that this artificial intelligence can develop and become made. And that artificial intelligence is the priority. Right? Right? That is the primacy. That's the importance. That's the priority. But we have to create, we have to lay a foundation of this world for it to start with, this environment that it can modify so that it can start the process. And people are above it. It's kind of what I, what I want to get at. If you look at creation, creation, God, um, think about this AI thing. God told man to have dominion over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. I want you to have the agency to modify your environment. And this dominion thing, this is one of the main themes of the Bible. If you are ideologically possessed, you would think that one of the main themes of the Bible is redemption. It's actually a sub-theme. The theme of the Bible is about who's got dominion. And the su main subject of the Bible, Jesus Christ, is the person who winds up having all the dominion in the end. Okay? So if you follow the concept of dominion throughout the Bible, you're much likely to understand it better than if you try to trace the concept of redemption in a narcissistic kind of way. Same thing in Genesis 9.1. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. All right, Take more agency in the earth. Now look at some of the reasons for creation. Ephesians 45.18. Thus saith the Lord God, uh, the Lord that created the heavens, for God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He hath created it not in vain. He formed it, what? To be inhabited. That's why he formed the earth. So the inhabitation of it was thought of above as a priority, and creating the earth was a backfill to meet that requirement. It's a necessary precondition. I am the Lord, there is none else. Isaiah 42.5 uh, Thus saith the Lord God, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. The point is the inhabitants, is the point of the place in the first place. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he hath given unto the children of men. So, you get the children of men, I need a place to put these children of men. I need a place to put my artificial intelligence. So I need this 3D interactive environment. Psalm 8, 3, 3, 8, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Whoa, look, we're glorifying man here. No, Psalm 8 is glorifying. Psalm 8 is glorifying man. You crazy Calvinists out there. Uh, uh, by the way, the whole point, the Calvinists think all the, the whole point of the New Testament is to give glory to God, and they use that as a non-epistemic ranking criteria for some of the points that they try to make. But in reality... Um, the one of the main points of the of the of the New Testament 
even in some of their famous proof texts. In Romans chapter 8, verses 29 through 30, the whole point is for us to be glorified. That's the point. The point of all this happening. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So the point that the artificial intelligence, they're supposed to have dominion over this environment and be able to modify it. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. That is all part of the environment designed for the AI. Thus saith the Lord God, Isaiah 42, 5. Thus saith the Lord, he hath created the heavens and stretched them out, spread forth the earth, it cometh of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and the spirit to them wherein. And now we looked at that over here a second ago, but now we're going to keep going and see what, where it goes next. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and I will hold thine hand. That's um, Ephesians 1, 4, to be holy and without blame before thee in love. And will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light to the Gentiles to open the blind eyes. Right? If you're relying on a statement of faith or a systematic theology or a confession of faith, your eyes are blind. In order to develop to the next level, next stage of the artificial intelligence to become more intelligent, you get to open those blind eyes and actually be able to see and not be relying on propositions. When you're relying on propositions, it means you can't see. To bring prisoners from the prison and them that set out in darkness from the prison house, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither uh, praise to graven images." Neither my praise to graven images, okay? If you are in a systematic theology, you are not worshiping the programmer of the simulation. You are worshiping some kind of propositions that are supposed to point to it, but don't do a very good job of it. The, if you are a Calvinist, you are giving praise to things like this, which is like giving praise to graven images. You are an idolater. You are not giving glory to God. You're giving glory to uh, an ideology created by men. And you are beholden to it. And that's what you're giving glory to. You're not giving glory to God. Isaiah 45, 11 through 13. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, his maker and his maker. Ask me of things. Israel's maker. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness and will direct his ways. He shall build my city. Now, a Calvinist would say, direct my ways because, you know, determinism, all that nonsense. But the point is, I want this artificial intelligence to beha behave in a certain way. And the better way to understand this is what we might call in the military shaping operations. I will provide things to catalyze growth in a certain area to cause the person to seek after wisdom. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives, not for price or reward, saith the Lord of hosts. We go from there. Now, I want to look at wisdom, concept of wisdom. <clears throat> if you are, hmm, where do I go from here? The concept of the fear of the Lord shows up in Proverbs chapter 8. And if you have the fear of the Lord, if you remove your concept of God from it, you might be having a grave respect for everything in the unknown. If you are beholden to something like this, or a creed, or a confession, you do not have any respect for the unknown. You do not fear the Lord. Okay, you have no. You think that the man has figured it all out, and all the men that you think are great, who wrote all the doctrine that you believe, you're basically treating them as if they are omniscient, which is a very hubristic thing to do. Don't do that. Okay, uh, grave respect for the numinous, the future, your future self. Sowing and reaping, that which judges. Collective intelligences, like the market. Okay, God works through those. Process theology. That which does not think. By the way, if God knows everything, that would be one way you could describe God. If God is unchanging, immutable, and knows everything, then he would also be that which never reacts, or never acts. Now, if you don't think that God never thinks, or God never acts or reacts, then you need to think, you need to rethink your concept of immutability and omniscience because those are the demands of those things. Um, so maybe you might mark those off if you rethink that. Process, the tendency for complexity to emerge from simplicity, which is one of the reasons that I can't tell you what the collective intelligence of Ephesians 4.16 will become and can produce because I cannot 
venture out into things, those things which I have not seen. This complexity will emerge from simplicity. I don't, I don't know what will emerge. I just need to know that I need to follow that edification process so that I can help facilitate its emergence. Do not confuse that with the emergent church because that's not the same thing. We're just using the word. Um, eternal dependencies for insight, external dependencies for insight. And some people are very egoic and they think that they are so smart and can study and they have processes and they know how to interpret the word and they're going to come up with all the truth that can come out of the Bible and that can come out of life. No, there's going to be a lot of external places that insight comes from that you need to rely on. So you need to have epistemic humility about that. Uh, the utility and ineptitude of language. You need to understand that and, uh, and avoidance of propositional tyranny. We have a lot of videos on the four kinds of knowing, which I encourage you highly to look into. If you search that on our channel, you will get a better idea of what that might be about if that sounds um, uh, strange to you. Perspectival infinitude. In other words, there's all kinds of perspectives that can supplement your current viewpoint. You need to have respect for those. And then there's participatory founding to all knowing. What have all of you participated in? And we do things backwards sometimes. Participatory knowing is the most fundamental kind of knowing. But, and then propositional knowing is the most shallow kind of knowing. And we tend to work backwards from propositions back to participatory. And it should be the other way around. We need to start with the participatory and, and then we can find propositions moving up from there. So when I say the fear of the Lord, when we mention that in a minute, all these kinds of things are things that I want you to bear in mind. You may decide that you want to screenshot that. And these might go away depending on what you think about some of the attributes of God. I want to start with the second half of Proverbs 8 first. I'm trying to talk fast so I can get through this and we can end this. Um, by the way, oh, somebody, thanks for the super chat. The uh, Supreme Pirate King says, keep up the good work. So <laughs> thanks for the super chat. <clears throat> trying to look through some of the other chat that we're going through here. Yeah, I would ask Kiss the Sun, you're posting a whole lot of stuff. If you could just listen, that would be helpful to a lot of people. Um, in Proverbs 8, let's talk about wisdom for a second. The Lord possessed me in the beginning. I'm starting on the second half of the chapter on purpose. And I want you to think about the creation of an artificial intelligence and wisdom and the logos being necessary components for the coalescence of the, of the distributed cognition and the collective intelligence that can possibly come from the full maturation of mankind in Christ. Okay. The Lord possessed me. Who's talking here? The me is personified wisdom. Wisdom is personified as a woman in Proverbs chapter 8. So the Lord possessed me, wisdom, in the beginning of his way before his works of old. Okay, I was set up from everlasting, from beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave uh, to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment. By the way, um, for those crazy people who think that all God's decrees are eternal, that's just absolutely remedial because the sea had to have existed before God to give this decree to it. Some of God's decrees occur in time. After things have been created. Why? Because the Bible says that. Remember, Sola Scripture. Go with Scripture first. Uh, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. So when we see this foundations of the earth, before the foundation of the world, right? Ephesians 1, 4. So this should call this, there's wisdom back there before all this time. Then was I by, was I by him as one brought up with him and was daily in his delight, rejoicing always before him. That's wisdom talking there. Rejoicing what? In the habitable part of his earth. Rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth. The part that has been created for the sake of these intelligences to interact and inhabit. And my delights were in the sons of men. That is where wisdom takes delight. Light take, wisdom can take delight in you. All right, in order for you to transform and reach maturation, that's what needs to happen. You need to take a dance with wisdom. Now, therefore, hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. You want to be blessed? Find wisdom. Hear instruction, be wise, and refuse it not. Blessed is a man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates. 
waiting at the posts of my doors, for whoso findeth me findeth life, and findeth favor with the Lord. So, hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, and we should be holy and without blame before him in love. This wisdom that was brought up with him, all right, before all of this, before his works of old, that same wisdom is what mankind are supposed to seek and walk after in order to find favor with the Lord. It's been there since the beginning, since before the foundation of the world, that wisdom has been sitting there. It's been there. And that is the way of movement. And the sons of men, you and I, are supposed to seek that wisdom and operate in accordance with it. Okay? Wisdom. Logos. And I kind of see those as very much overlapping, but not exactly the same thing. Uh, logos is a... Uh, it, is, it is wise to pursue the Logos, in other words. Okay? Wisdom has a movement to it. As is the Logos. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. They that hate me love death. So this, this is like an elongated way of the exact same thing Ephesians 1, 4 and 2, 10 and 4, 1 are saying. Is that this, this wisdom which was with God before his works of old is the same thing that men need to get a hold of today in order to find life and obtain favor with the Lord, with the process of reality with base reality. So if you back it up to the beginning of the first half of Proverbs chapter 8, doth not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth at the top of the high places and the ways of the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates of the entrance of the city, coming of the door unto you, O men, I call and my voice is to the sons of man. Okay? Why? She rejoices in the habitable parts and, the, and then the sons of men, her delight is in the sons of men. The sons of men need to get hold of her. They need, to, they need to interact with her in order to achieve their full potential. That's why she exists. That's why she's there. Okay, from before the foundation of the world. Oh, ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be of an understanding heart, for I will speak excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination of my lips, and the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understands, and right to them that find knowledge of my instruction and not silver. Receive my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not worthy to be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and every evil way in the froward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine, sound wisdom. I am understanding, I have strength. By me kings reign, and princes decree justice. By me princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me. Philia Sophia, the love of wisdom. That's what Philia Sophia means. Not the love of victory, not the, not the love of winning a debate, but the love of victory. And when you're in an, a systematic theology or an ideology or a paradigm that forces you, it tells you what you're supposed to think about passages rather than explore them in an open-ended way like we're trying to do here. It shuts you off to wisdom. You become a wisdom stultifier. You, you block off wisdom. Those that held the truth in unrighteousness and suppressed the truth in unrighteousness out of Ephesians, out of Romans chapter 1. That's what's going on with people who are ideologically possessed. Possessed by an ideology. People don't have ideas. Ideas have people. And those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me. A durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold. Yea, than fine gold. My revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness. Holy and without blame before me in love. Okay? In the midst of paths of judgment. Okay? You exercise discernment and judgment. That I may cause those that love me to inherit substance and I will fill their treasures. Okay? So if you get, if you get choice gold and rubies and you're seeking after that, you may seek it. But if you get wisdom first, then whatever is of value will come as a result of having wisdom. <sighs> Wisdom is with God from before the foundation of the world. What else is with God from before the foundation of the world? In John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, the Logos. What's that word? It is the Logos. And the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything that made that was made. 
and him was life, and the life was the light of men. <laughs> so the light, the light of men, the understanding of men, the capacity for wisdom of men is connected to the Logos. Okay? So these things are with God, wisdom, the Logos, they're with God, they're in the beginning, and they have a, a they, I don't want to say the word dictate, but they kind of dictate the paths and the flow in which men should operate in order to achieve their full potential wherever they are. Seek after wisdom. So man was created in Ephesians 1, 4. If we go to Ephesians 1, 4. Man was created before the foundation of the world. And like we have modified it for the sake of paraphrase, man was created above in, in primacy. Had primacy and more importance and priority over the foundation of the world. Because the point is the creature, the artificial intelligence, if we put ourselves in the, in the, in the shoes of God. <clears throat> so, let's look at some of the comments before we end this up, see what some folks are thinking. Um, yeah, John 17, 24 is a clarifying verse for it. Ephesians 1, 4. Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world, is what John 17, 24 says. And so if you are in Christ, you are also loved before the foundation of the world. But that is also presuming that before is a order of chronology kind of thing, a sequence kind of thing. And we are specifically trying to look at Ephesians 1, 4 like this. And if you do that, that could also be clarifying of John 17, 24. Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world above priority and importance over the foundation of the world is what that could be. <clears throat> what does B flat say? <laughs> right. Yeah, we want to keep the uh we want to keep the flow of the con of the live chat in in accordance with what what is going on in the content here. Sometimes I can get good insight from the chat, and if it's off on a tangent or something else, or people are just posting a bunch of verses or whatever, it's it's um not going to be very helpful. I don't want to take away from what's discussed now, but Kevin, how do you deal with thought processes that say sola scriptura concept is inconsistent? Uh, an order EO teaches this concept. I'm not sure exactly what you're trying to say, but if you were following only scripture, by the way, only three of the solas, only three of the five solas came out during the time of the Reformation. The, the other two were added. I don't remember which of the three, but the other three were added later. But most of the people who run around saying sola scriptura don't actually mean it. And if, and also sola scriptura would necessarily encompass things outside. For example, um, let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. If I am following sola scriptura, then I'm also talking to a whole bunch of other Christians and getting edified from them, you see? Because that's telling me what to do. I, it's telling me to interact with them, and I got the idea to interact with these other Christians from scripture. So it doesn't mean I stick to just the content of scripture, it means that I follow the procedure of Scripture in order to learn, grow, discover, and transform. And this procedure of Ephesians 4, 13 through 16 is part of Scripture. If you were to go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Scripture, by the way, this Scripture is not the original autographs. It is whatever Timothy knew from a child, right? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Well, if scripture can thoroughly furnish a person unto all good works, then what other good works remain to which scripture did not thoroughly furnish them? You see there? <laughs> so you kind of... Are there some other good works for which Scripture does not thoroughly furnish a person that are gotten from outside? And whatever you name from outside Scripture, if it is legitimate, it is found in Scripture. Like consorting with, uh, consorting, <laughs> consulting with other Christians in, in an edification process. That's actually found in Scripture to do that. So you may hear insight from somebody else or from elsewhere, but we're told to do that. In Scripture, we have an example of... Um, 
Solomon going and collecting all kinds of data from everywhere under the sun. And then he's able to apply that through wisdom and through the logos to, to reduce it down to something very simple and plain. No reason why you can't do that. There's no reason why uh, you can't watch anything from Pinocchio to the Lion King and see the logos in it. And the capacity to do that would be generated from following scripture prompting you to do that. Okay. So it's, it's, you know, what people mean when they say solo scripture is strange. You know, it, it doesn't really mean anything because it's not defined well enough in my opinion. Um, Proverbs 8 was the first passage to make me rethink Calvinism. So, so, so good. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> wake up, read it, and cried. Trying to read these kind of fast to get through some of these. So, Kiss the Sun said, knowledge builds pride in us. Well, propos- propositional tyranny kind of knowledge. Not all knowledge builds pride. Um, a lot of knowledge can build humility, actually. But knowledge that puffeth up, knowledge is not necessarily being pride. But what I would say is that propositional knowledge without procedural, perspectival, and participatory knowledge is like a knowledge bubble. And that's what puffs somebody up to be able to talk a big game but not be able to deliver on it. You might be able to explain if, if you listen to, like, I do not play professional baseball, but if I listen to 200 professional baseball pitchers describe the difficulties of learning how to pitch well, I might be able to mimic some of that and fake somebody out that I could also do that procedure. But that would be puffed up. That would be knowledge. I, I would be presenting my ego to other people as something that it's not trying to pass myself off as also being a professional baseball pitcher when I don't have the capacity to do that, okay? And so the problem problem with systematic theology, ideology of any kind, like Calvinism or any other kind, is that it gives people who can't see clearly a bunch of words to pass themselves off as if they can see clearly. That's why they have to spend, if you listen to some of the people, like the guy that just debated uh, Leighton Flowers, he talks, he talks so fast, so quickly, because he's got all these words figured out, and he, he's got it so lined up in the wording that you know he can't see a thing. He can't see a thing at all. He's completely blind because he's so relying on word. That kind of word, uh, puffing up, is... That kind of knowledge, where it's just propositional, that is what puffs up because there's nothing to back it up. There's no, there's no participatory ecology of practices by which one is in touch with base reality. They just have a bunch of words, okay? Vain words puffed up. You being a new Christian is more perspectively valuable than you're lending credence to. You probably have perspectives which ideologically calloused Christians can only access without some. I would, I would totally agree with that because some of us have been saved, have been trusting Christ as Savior since, like, for, in my case, the age of five, the month before I turned six, on October 14th, 1984, okay? And I've been taught so many things about Scripture that I, I can't not see it that way. And then when someone comes on who's only been saved for six months or a year or three years or something like that, they will provide insights in the text that are very fresh and very corrective of the bad presuppositions that I've been trained with. So I actually, I actually learn more from new Christians who are not perspectively cluttered than I do from so-called seasoned Christians. Seasoned Christians tend to be clogged from the logos, which is not good. It's a it's a product of the church not doing what it's supposed to be doing, not providing the edification that needs to be provided. Let's see what else do we have here? Uh, 1 John 2.27 does not support scripture only. Now the problem with this is that 1 John 2.27 is scripture. So if you are doing 1 John 2.27, 
that you can't do that without scripture having said it. Does that make sense? So if you are, you need not that any man teach you and the Holy Ghost is teaching you. Well, scripture just said that. So even when you do 1 John 2, 27, <laughs> uh, it still came from scripture. I've uh, been wrestling with a circular sock machine this a.m. All right. Okay. So I think that's the end of the comments. I'm sorry I can't get to all of them, but I appreciate uh, everyone who did comment. I appreciate the super chats as well. That helps keep us going here. Um, yeah. So the concept of before the foundation of the world, we looked at above the foundation of the world is in higher priority than the foundation of the world, simply meaning that what mankind is capable of in Christ is the reason the world was created in the first place because we needed a place to inhabit in order to be able to achieve the collective intelligence that is possible in order to be able to get to our our full potential as mankind in Christ. So that's what we're getting at. Appreciate all the comments. Appreciate you watching. Uh, thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.